Okay. Yeah, the wind or the <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nathan Brown. I'm the finance manager for the Atlanta Metro Photo Banker. I've already introduced myself to a few of you. Um, Brad has asked me to come speak with you guys today about running your business as a business. You all are in business for yourself. You are associated with Photo Banker as independent contractors, but you truly are running business for yourself. And you're in business for yourself. And with that comes a lot of great things. You say you're on schedule, you get to do what you want to do within the parameters of you know, real estate. And with that also comes a lot of responsibilities. And we'll talk about that today. Um, mainly today we're going to talk about two things. Um, first off, we're going to talk about business planning and how to set goals and a plan for yourself for however long, six months, a year, you know, three years. <coughs> And kind of get to where you want to be, and to, to reach your goals that you set for yourself. And then we'll also, <coughs> excuse me, we'll also be talking about accounting for the agent, and what that means is not accounting where the agents are, but the accounting that you need to do in your business to help you succeed financially. So first off, um, and if you have any questions throughout, just go ahead, and raise your hand. You know, just interrupt me. That's fine. I like you know uh, informal, informal setting. So. Go ahead and interrupt. Um, so first off, um, through the business plan, we'll talk about why businesses in general have a plan. Not just you know why it's good for you, but why businesses themselves do it. Because it is a good practice to get into. And then we'll talk about business planning for you, the individual agent. Uh, and we'll talk about what goes into the plan and what the important metrics are of that plan. And then we'll talk about meeting with your manager and having accountability, not necessarily to your manager, but to yourself. So first off, we're going to start with why businesses have a plan. A plan is not for businesses is not just revenue and expense. You know how much is going to come in and how much are we going to spend and what's your profit going to be. There are different plans that go into making up the entire roadmap that the business will follow. Uh, it depends on the business type. Uh, you'll have sales budgets, you know, sales plans. How much are we going to sell every month? Um, and with that comes a market or a manufacturing plan if it's a manufacturing business. You know, if we're going to sell this many units, we have to make this many units. And if we're going to make this many units, we have to purchase this much raw material. Uh, so you'll have the sales plan, the mark, uh, the manufacturing plan, the um, the cash flow plan. The money's got to come in so we can pay for those purchases, and all of that makes up the entire roadmap that a business will use. Uh, and, and business will do it because it provides. Um, or it makes sure the expenses aren't exceeding pre-planned uh, levels. They're able to set goals and expectations that are written down and reviewed consistently throughout the year. And their metrics can be evaluated and their practices adjusted when they can compare their actual, um, their actual results to their expected outcomes and see if, if they're on target or if they're not. Why aren't those um, actuals meeting their expected results? And so then they can adjust throughout the year and, and, and be better business practitioner. Okay, so what does that mean for you, the agent? Um, you guys should have a plan as well. You know, you have, I want to make this much money, and, you know, at the end of the day, this is what I want to take home. Well, in that you have, yes, you have your revenue, but you also have your business expenses that you need to plan out. And you also have that wonderful thing called taxes at the end of the year that you have to pay. And you want to know, okay, if, if I do this much, how much am I going to have to set aside throughout the year so when it comes April 15th, I have the cash necessary to pay those taxes. Okay. Um, as you plan and, and do your business planning, these are the drivers. We, we say, no, you're drivers. These are the same things that we do. You know, Brett can attest. What I'm making a company-wide plan for the revenue, I'm using every single one of these. When I come to the managers, Brett and I sit down every year, and we say, okay, how many listings are you going to have? What's your opens going to be? We go through each of these drivers. And each of you have your own set of drivers yourself. And driver, we call them drivers because that's what drives your revenue. And we'll go through each of these individually. Number one, you've got listings. Listings will be out there. And, and they, they indirectly affect everything else in that you have a listing. It may or may not go under contract, but from that listing, hopefully you're getting additional sign calls, you're getting additional listings, you're getting uh, additional buyers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then, when you have a buyer or you that listing goes under contract, we have what we call open units. You know, an open unit is just a contract that has been accepted. 
uh, once you have a contract that is accepted, you can do one of two things. It can close or it can fall out. Now, we, what we call, we call that the fail rate or the fallout rate. If you have, if you write five contracts and you have five accepted offers and four close and one doesn't, your fallout rate is 20%, one out of five. And then so from that, you have that fallout rate of 20%, then you get to your closed units. Of those five that you wrote, one fell out, you have four. Yes? Um, would the fall rate only be counted then if something, if it ultimately uh, got canceled, like the contract got canceled? In other words, a lot of times uh, something goes on the contract that goes away, side, another contract comes in, so forth. Would that still count as a, ultimately a close? You, you, would, you would count it as both. You would still count it as a fall because that contract that you wrote fell out. Now you have to do additional work because let's say you have a buyer that you're taking out and you write a contract, you've done all the work to get them to get that contract contract accepted. And then, for whatever reason, do, during the due diligence or the appraisal or something, that deal falls apart and you don't take it to those. Well, guess what? You can take those buyers back out, show them a bunch more property because the properties that you show them while you're, while you're working on that contract, they're now gone. So now you have to show them more property and get them back to the point where they, they're writing a contract. So it's additional work that you have to do to get that to close. So that still is going to count against you as a not necessarily against you, but it's still going to count in your fallout rate because you're doing the, doing more work. And part of it is if you can tighten up that fallout rate and go from maybe a 20% to a 10%, you're having to do less work to get paid, you know, to close the same amount of deals and get paid the same amount of money. So from that, like I said, you have the, the fail rate, you have closed units because those that didn't fall out closed. And then you have your average sales price. You know, and that's going to be, you know, you close one for $300,000, you close one for $400,000, your average price is $350,000. Um, and then you have your commission rate, uh, full commission, 6% listing, you keep 3%. Um, are, you, are you getting full commission or are you discounting? You know, it's important to know what your average commission rate is. And then, obviously, you each have your own individual commission split, and that can adjust. If, you know, if you have a great year, if you start moving up through the levels, that's going to go up. So as you look at this and you set your plan, you can say, I'm going to take this many listings. And then, you know, you go out and you do that. And from those li listings, I'm going to get X number of opens. I'm going to have a certain percent <coughs> fallout. So let's say you get 20 opens in a year, and you have a 20% fallout rate. Four won't close. So you close 16 deals. Now, average sales price comes into play here, and you say, all right, right now, Last year, I closed an average sales price of $250,000. Now, next year, that's going to hopefully go up with, you know, back in price appreciation mode, where, you know, even if you're selling the same houses, you're going to increase a little bit right there. So you may go from 250 to 270. But you can really affect your bottom line by shifting from that 250 to 270 range, going maybe just down the street to a higher price, you know, community. And now all of a sudden you're selling four fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. You're doing the same work, but your sales price is higher. You're getting more money. Okay, commission rate. Actually, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm digressing back mm -hmm. to the listings and the fallout rate because technically I can have a greater fallout rate, not even have listings if I have ten contracts on the same listing. So I have one listing. Mm -hmm. But ten fallouts. Correct, but but you have but it's not necessarily the listings that the, the, the fallout. It's the contract that's falling out. So you have the listings, yeah. and then separately you have an open unit because if you have the listing, somebody brings you a contract right. that your that your seller accepts. Yeah. That's a, that's an open unit. Oh, right. So it's your open units that are that are falling out. And that's why I say listings are indirectly tied. They bring more business, yeah. but when we start with with calculating how much business you need to do to make your bottom line the number that you want, we really start with open units. Okay. Listings will bring the business, but open units is, is where we kick off because then they can start calling out or closing. Like I said, a listing may never have, a, have an offer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we're back on the commission rate. So, you know, company, you know, company standards is 6% listing, 3% to the, you know, to our, to the listing side, 3% on the buyer side. Are you getting that full commission or are you discounting and saying, you know what, I'll do it for 5%, I'll do it for 5.5%, taking 25 to yourself? Well, right there, you're already discounting your bottom line, your, your earnings. And 
you know, that just, that just ends up hurting you in the long run. <coughs> now you're going to do it. You do it once, you get to keep doing it. So really, you need to look, am I getting a full commission? If you are getting a full commission, great. But can I grow that? And we have people in this company, I think in this office, getting 7% <coughs> listings, keeping four to their side, and paying three to your call-out broker. Great. Now you just increased your, your commission by a third, your earnings by a third on that deal. And so, you know, with, with the professionalism of our agents and with the power of Coldwell Baker behind you, there's really no reason you can't go out and be getting seven. And then if you, if in your listing presentation, you're asking for seven and you need to discount from there, you're still at least holding strong at the six. So there's no reason when you go out, just ask for seven because you're worth it. And it, of course, helps your bottom line. Um, then the last thing is we go back to the agent commission split. All of these will affect your GCI. You know, you have your open units times your fall out rate, gives you your closed units multiplied by your average sales price, um, gives you your volume times your commission rate, gives you GCI. As you know, as your GCI increases, your levels will increase, meaning you may go from a 65 to a 70 or 70 to 75, and all your business will be paid at that rate going forward. So you've not only increased the GCI that you're bringing in, but you've also increased the rate at which you're keeping that GCI in your pocket. So as you sit down and do your plans, you can map out and say, all right, for this year, I may start at level 70, but at the, you know, by August, I'm going to be at 75, and all this additional GCI will be paid at 75, and next year I'm at 75. So you can, you can use these, these plans to map out at, the, you know, at what point in time are you going to increase, and how much is that going to help me at the end of the year, and then again into next year. Are there any other questions on the drivers? Okay. That takes us right into meeting with your manager. Um, it's great to meet with your manager, not just, you know, goal set in the beginning of the year, but again throughout the year, probably quarterly or as frequently as you feel necessary with your manager. Because you come in the first part of the year and you say, okay, this is where I want to be. You know, I want to close this many units. I want to be in this average price point. And it may be an increased price point from what you're used to. The manager can help you get there. They can say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put this marketing plan in place to get you to the, the price point you want to be at. And then, so you have you, you set your goals with the manager. And then throughout the year, you go back in, again, maybe quarterly, and say, okay, am I on target to meet the goals that I want? And if I'm not, what do I need to do to fix? You know, what, how can I fix that? And start getting the getting the uh, the contracts that I need, getting the listings that I need to, to meet my goals. You know, or if you're ahead of target, maybe you reforecast and say, okay, you know what? Instead of doing 20, I'm going to do 25. You know, why just hit 20 in October and stop? Keep going, and and you know, if you're going to hit that 20, extend that out. Um, and meeting with your manager allows you to be held accountable. Like I said earlier, it's not necessarily being accountable to your manager because, again, you are an independent contractor. And ultimately, you're accountable to yourself and to your family. And that's how the manager can help is make you, make you be accountable to yourself. If you have that meeting, you know you've got to come in and you've got to meet. You've got to say, I didn't meet my goals. Okay? And then you say, okay, why didn't we? And how do we fix that? So it's a way for you to keep on track and keep yourself motivated in order to, do, to get to your goals. Okay? Okay, next. That basically wraps up the, you know, the business planning. Now we're gonna get into the accounting um, for the agent, what you guys need to do to help um, you know, keep track of your finances on, the, on your business side. Uh, in this, we're going to talk about the importance of having a separate bank account for your business activities. We're going to talk about when it's important to hire a professional, uh, the difference between incorporating and organizing and why people do it and the benefits and the, the, um, the cons of, of doing either. And we'll talk about the importance of knowing where you're spending your money. Okay. Uh, a lot of you may already have this, but it's very important that you open and operate a separate bank account for your business. And with that, you're going to run all your business income through that account. You won't be putting any personal revenue in, um, you know, wherever that may come from. It, this will only be business revenue coming in. 
Now, if you need to put money in, you will take it out, or if you need to make expenses, if you may not have the money in your business account, you would take it from your personal account, put it into the business account, and then, um, then pay your bills, pay the expenses out of that. Uh, then, you know, as the money comes into your business, you know, as you have a closing, money goes in, you can take a portion of that out into your personal account to pay your personal bills. So you're not commingling those monies. It's not necessarily like you know, commingling with earnest money, but it's still you're not commingling those dollars. And you have a, a record of where that money went uh, for each business transaction. Now, sometimes you'll have uh, personal expenses that are also business expenses, or a portion of them may be business expenses. So let's say you have a cell phone and you have a family plan. Um, a portion of that plan is personal, a portion of that plan is business. What you'd want to do where you have um, expenses that are both, pay it out of your personal account, and then do a kind of a reimbursement back from that personal or from the business account to your personal account. So kind of an expense report type that, that says, um, I paid for the cell phone and it was 250 bucks, only 150 of that was business, so I'm gonna write a check for 150 from the for, from the business expense, put it in my personal <coughs> to help cover those expenses. And then you'll want to have a accounting or banking software. And you know these are just a couple uh, of the offerings. There's a lot more out there. Uh, there's internet-based stuff that you can use um, in addition to these. Um, the first two, the Microsoft Money, the Quicken. Uh, there's you know one that, that I use is called Mint. Uh, it's an online it's Mint.com. These are banking software, and that you're you're just tracking your transactions, your money in, your money out. And for most of what you're doing, that is completely adequate. It, these soft, excuse me, software programs track the categories <coughs> as you go. So you know you may have your you'll you'll have your revenue, you'll have your market expenses, you'll have your your cell phone, um, whatever kind of expenses you have. You can track them in different categories. Then at the end of the year or throughout the year, if you want to review them. But at the end of the year, when it comes to taxes, you can print that out, take it to a tax professional, and they have your, your spend right down. Um, if you want to get into more accounting pieces, QuickBooks is a good program. Again, there's a couple, there's other ones out there. Um, Peachtree is out there. Um, and that's if you have assets that you want to depreciate, or again, if you want to have a full on accounting program, which you know, as an agent, that's not really necessary, but you also have professional, you know, you have your account that can take care of that if you're just running through the first two with the accounting books or with the uh, banking stuff. So again, having that, that business bank account is very important. You can put it in the same place you have your personal, you can transfer funds back and forth online, but make sure that you're track, keeping track of everything you do in and out of that account. Any questions on the bank account? Okay. Hiring a professional. You guys are professional in your job. When somebody wants to sell a house, you cringe when they say they want to sell it themselves because they don't know what they're doing. You guys are professional when it comes to selling real estate and representing people in real estate brokers. You guys aren't professional accountants. You guys aren't attorneys. You should be seeking those people out. Um, that's not your... That's not your core competency. You need to focus where you're good at. You could, you're good at selling real estate, and that's where you're going to make your money. Why? Is, you may say, well, I can do it myself. Yes, you can, but are you going to give up more time that you can be prospecting and serving your clients and making money? And you could make more than what you would have spent in, in hiring that professional. You know, I'm, I'm not going to pay in my house. I'm going to hire a pan because all the time I waste, you know, paying, I can I could be much more productive elsewhere. Um, when you hire somebody to do your tax preparation, this is really important, I believe, because I see a lot of people get in, you know, in tax situations where at the beginning of the year, they just said, well, you know, at the end of the year, I'll just add everything up and pay my taxes. Well, every transaction you do, every financial transaction you do throughout the year has tax implications. <coughs> and knowing what those implications are can help save you or end up costing you a lot of tax at the end of the year. So planning out, you know, taking a business plan and talking to your, your tax advisor is important. You know, I'm going to be buying a car this year. Is it better to buy? Is it better to lease? Which way, how should I, how should I structure the purchase of this asset? 
So being able to plan ahead of time will, will end up saving you quite a bit at the end of the year. Um, having a tax uh, professional will ensure proper filing. What forms do you need to file? Are you taking all the all the proper deductions? Are you taking, you know, are you not taking deductions you shouldn't take? And are you taking all the ones you're entitled to? They can help save you there. Uh, the IRS estimates that it takes 57 hours to complete the 1040 <coughs> with your Schedule C. At eight hours a day, that's more than seven days. It's a lot of time, a lot of headache. And again, back to are you ensuring you're filing properly? You know, TurboTax is great, I use it, but it can only ask you questions. If you don't know how to answer those questions, you may not be filing correctly. You may not be taking all the deductions you're entitled to because it doesn't know, all it knows is what you're telling it. It, it can't think outside of, of its logic. Um, and then they can also make sure that you're making your estimated tax payments throughout you know, every quarter and that you're saving enough for the tax payment at the end of the year. The most or, or the highest garnishments that we get are. IRS tax audits, and they're brutal. You know, a typical garnishment can take 25% of your of your commission. The IRS will say you're entitled to $500 a month. Everything else that comes in, we're going to take. You need to avoid those because it's not at the end of the day, it's not just the taxes that you're paying, but you're paying penalties and interest, and that can exceed the normal tax bill. So make sure you're saving enough, and the the tax professional can help you know how much that will be based on the plan that you have set at the beginning of the year. Um, <clears throat> and accountants, that can be the same person as your tax professional, or it can be a different person. Accountants have different specialties. Uh, some are great at, at keeping your books for you, talking to you about um, you know, finances, but they may not be good at taxes. I've helped people do their taxes that had a CPA do their tax, and the CPA missed so much stuff because they're not a tax professional. So. If they are a tax professional, great, you can do two in one. Otherwise, have two different people, two different professionals, because again, they're they're different specialties. Yes? Off the top of your head, you wouldn't have to know what the minimum taxes are. For? For, well, taxes. Uh, well, it depends on, obviously, it's going to depend on how much you make. As a, well, no, no, I understand that. Mm -hmm. That's why you say the minimum. Because it's like five years, fifteen point five yeah. or something like that. That's what I'm that. saying. With, with be, being self-employed, so you have <coughs> the employee <coughs> portion and the employer portion of Medicare and Social Security, fifteen point three percent, I believe, okay. uh, combined between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, it's seven point six five for the employee, seven point six five percent for the employer. You're both. You get a payroll. You would have to know what state is, would you? Uh, state doesn't have that. Uh, state has. Uh, but on the income side, they do have a graduated. I think it caps out at six percent. Okay. Uh, but it goes through that quickly, so almost everything that you make is going to be at six percent. Federal, okay. yeah. it depends on are you filing uh, jointly, yeah. uh, married filing jointly, or are you single? Self, I just wonder what the minimum federal yeah. is. Um, after all your deductions, if you're single, um, after your deductions, your exemption, the first mm -hmm. about eight to ten thousand dollars is. Is non taxed above that, you're at 10 percent, then 15 percent, then 25, right. 28 That's what I'm on up. So, yeah. 10, 6, and 15. Yeah, it is going to be your, your first all. Now, the 15 is, is from dollar one, whereas mm -hmm. the you know the State income tax rate are, are after you get your deduction and, and your exemptions. Um, but again, your professional tax professional and your account would be yeah. able to talk to no, you. Just trying to calculate rough numbers. I've heard as a rule of thumb that it's advisable to put away a third of your income to cover your taxes. Is that so, correct? That, that would be great. It depends, it's going to depend on how much you make. Uh, because the higher you make, the less percentage of your income is is exempt from tax. Sure, but then that's gravy at the end. Yeah, and, and so if you're putting that away and you don't spend that much, it, it's just like a tax refund to you. Because you put it aside, mm -hmm. though you may not have sent it to the IRS, yeah. you, you can kind of count that as a refund back to you, or, or save put it in a SEP. Put it put in a SEP. That's a IRA um, vehicle for self-employed people. That's you know a great opportunity to save money for the future. And you know some, that's something I don't have up here is a, uh, a finan financial planner. You know it's great to have one of those to help you direct your money after you you've made it. You're saving for retirement. 
you need to be putting that money away. Um, as a self-employed individual, you don't have access to a 401k, uh, but there's IRAs out there, there's Roth IRAs, there's set plans. Um, that, that set plan has a lot higher um, annual allowance than does a regular or traditional IRA. So it's good to get involved with a financial planner to help with that. Yes. There's no such thing as a Roth set, is there? Like not being um, able to pay the taxes and then have a tax I'm reset? not sure. Uh, that's exactly why you'd want to talk to a financial planner because they'll be able to help you with that. I'm heading back to that uh, <laughs> Running off screen here. Yeah. So, so definitely you'd want to talk to someone with that as well. Now, you may not know, you know, you may be looking for one of these, you may not know good ones. Um, there's going to be people who specialize in real estate, whether it's for tax purposes, for accounting purposes, or financial planning purposes. Um, Talk to your fellow agents in your office, find out who they use. And don't just go with, with one recommendation and, and hire that person. You know, a lot of sellers will will uh, interview several different agents from several different companies when they're listing a house. And they'll go with whoever fits their their uh, personality best. Do the same. Don't be afraid to you know interview three or four different people and maybe they say, you know what, I work best with you and I'm going to give my business to you. So go ahead and, and get a few recommendations and talk to them and find out what works best for you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, organizing and incorporating. This is business structure. Um, it'll come, there might come a time when you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and organize. Because uh, when you first start out in real estate, a lot of people will just go ahead and go with you know, pay me, I'm the entity, you pay me, I have a separate bank uh, business account, I deposit everything in there and I pay everything out of that. Um, as you get into the business and the money's coming in and you decide, you know what, I need to be a little more protected, I need to have a business structure. These are the two of the most common. You have the S Corp, which stands for Subchapter S, it's a corporation. Uh, you basically have two types. You have a C Corp and an S Corp. Uh, the main difference is under a C Corp, you have the shareholders and all the dividends that you pay out to the shareholders are taxed as well as the corporation is taxed. Uh, S Corp, both of these actually, the S Corp and the LLC, are what they call pass through entities. The corporation or the entity does not pay the taxes. They file a return at the end of the year, distributing all the income to their owners, and the owners pay the tax on it. So under a C Corp, you have the, the, the corporation pays tax and the dividends to the owners are taxed. Under the S Corp, it's only taxed once. That's why people like to have the S Corp with the small business because they don't have the, the double taxation. LLC, again, pass through entity. Um, you only have the single taxation. Both of them offer limited liability in as long as you're treated as a business. If you're running personal expenses through your business, a judge is going to say you don't have that. So if something were to happen and someone were to sue you, for whatever reason, whether it's real estate related or not, you're driving somebody around and you get hit in your car and they can sue you. They're suing the entity and you have limit, you have protection where they're not going to be able to attach to your personal assets. But then don't you need to put the car in the, in the name of the corporation yep. in order to get that veil? Otherwise, it's again, still a personal vehicle. Exactly. Again, that's why I say it needs to be run as a business. You need to have the assets to the business. You need to make sure that you're running everything like you would. And you will want to have insurance for the business. And we'll get to that, that's the last slide, is, is insurances. Um, so they both offer limited liability protection. The, um, the similarities additionally are, they both have more complex tax laws. You don't just file your 1040 with the Schedule C, you have to file, um, I believe it's an 1120, and a, a, I don't remember the number, but it's a different form for the LLC uh, to distribute that income. And then you go ahead and file your personal taxes. They also require legal filings to be set up, um, and that can be, you know, if, if you do it yourself, it can be a couple hundred bucks up to a thousand or more to set up. Um, I would, if, if you were going to go one of these routes, whichever one you were to choose, you would definitely want to hire an attorney to do so. I did that a few years ago. Uh, it, was in, it was in Utah. I don't know what the prices out here are, but it was 450 bucks to have the LLC set up beginning to end. To me, it's, you know, I'm making sure that it's set up right, and I'm not, not setting myself up for failure. Uh, to me, it's money well spent. 
Um, the main difference between the S-Corp and the LLC are the payroll tax savings. We talked about the 15.3% um, Social Security and Medicare tax. You can get out of it under an LLC, but you can under the S-Corp. Under an S-Corp, if you pay yourself a reasonable salary, and reasonable is not, you know, five bucks an hour, reasonable salary is going to be what a reasonable what would be reasonable for a real estate agent to make in, in the city of Atlanta. But what you can do there is anything above that salary would not be subject to the um, Social Security and Medicare tax. So you can save quite a bit of money through the S plan. The LLC does not have that benefit. Everything that goes through is subject to that, to that uh, self-employment tax and the Social Security tax. Uh, typically what I will see um, agents do is for their typical, you know, their everyday <coughs> business, they'll set up this S Corp and run everything through there so they're getting those payroll tax advantages. Then, if they own uh, rental real estate, they will set that up under one or more LLCs. If they have multiple properties, I've seen some people just put all their multiple properties under one LLC. I've seen people do one LLC per, per property because each LLC is going to have its own individual. Um, protection. So if you have 10 under one LLC and your tenant slips and falls at one of the houses, all properties could potentially be attached. All assets could be attached. So I'll see people say, you know what, one's probably too tight. I'll do three, you know, and they'll, they might have four different LLCs with three properties in each, get into 12 total properties. So again, the S Corp is great for your day-to-day -day business activities. LLC is really good for, um, for rental properties. But again, talk to your accountant, talk to find out what's best for you, talk to get, you know, get legal re representation to determine how best to set that legal protection up. So file, creating an LLC is pretty simple. All you need to do is go to the Secretary of State online mm -hmm. and register it. And that's really all that just goes to it. You don't need to pay you, lots you, of money to get it you done. You don't need to pay lots of money. You I do want somebody to help you with the articles of an organization if that's really necessary. Yes, I, and, and to that point, I actually, uh, about the same time I would say mine up, and I, I, again, like I said, I paid four or four fifty for that. I had a friend create an LLC. We compared, and because he, he did his online, he used one of the online tools for the state, and when we compared, the, the one that my attorney set up with all the articles of organization was a lot cleaner, a lot tighter as to what I can do. It was more broad-based than what his was set up for. Um, it, you can do it, and it's, I'm not saying it's wrong, but just make sure that you're doing what's best for you. Yes. I think my experience is when you get an attorney to set up one time, then you have a template of a you know, future. organization that you could then do the rest yourself online without having to spend, spend any time if you're a funded LLC. Correct. What I hear from investors sometimes, though, is, is that they want attorneys to set up because then they are listed as the person registering it, and your name is actually never shows up That's right. in the Secretary of State search. Right. And so a lot of investors that own multiple properties, for instance, they'll do individual LLCs for each property and have an attorney set it up. Mm -hmm. And that way, you know, the random slip and fall person going out to try and get a payday um, can't look you up and realize that you own you know, a yeah. million dollars worth of property or whatever, they think you just don't, or they don't even see that you own anything. Yeah. And so that's part of, you know, not that you can't pierce that veil fairly easily, but the average person searching isn't <laughs> going to see that you own all of these different things. Yeah. So. One other question, is the S-Corp uh, harder to pierce than the LLC? They both have the same um, limited liability protection. <coughs> so it's not that it's more or less uh, protection under the that uh, entity. It's just, you know, it's mainly <coughs> the payroll tax. The, the savings of the payroll tax, why people would choose an S Corp over an LLC. It is a little more work, as you can see, you do have to file annual corporate filings under the S Corp because it is a corporation where you don't have that responsibility under the LLC. Much more expensive on your taxes. But, yeah, so take, you know, it, is it worth the, all the savings you're going to get through the payroll tax savings to, to file that annually? Most people say yes, it is. What, do you have an idea of an income threshold from this business that justifies? Uh, talk to, your, to the accountant and, and find that out. For myself, 
I would be around a fifty thousand dollars because, and I say that because to me that would be where I would set my reasonable wage. So if I was setting this up under an S corp, I'd say at fifty thousand dollars, that's reasonable salary. I'm gonna go ahead and pay myself fifty thousand dollars. Everything above that is gonna be, um, I'm not gonna pay the taxes on. So below that, I'm not really getting tax savings. So why why go through the hassle every year of filing and the cost of setting it up and maintaining it? Right, and I mean you also get the payroll savings of an S corp, but then because there are shareholders, you can have what five shareholders in an S corp. You can then have corporate distributions, which are separate from your, but those are also taxable as independent distributions, aren't they? No, it's, no because, because it's, because it's pass through, so each one is going to be whatever percent ownership right. they have. They're going to pay tax on that percent of ownership. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful on the distributions because the IRS will look at it and say you're just sheltering the tax, and they have like if you want to do it with your kids and, and each of them get a certain portion. They can look at that and go, well, th they're going to pay the same tax rate that the parents do, just to discourage people from doing that, because the IRS knows people will do that to show money for tax purposes. So again, talk to the accountant. The accountant's going to be able to direct you on how best to set this up. Any more questions on the organization on the entity slide? Okay. Right. Um, the third one is tracking your spending. Um, these two have personal marketing costs. You know, the company is does a great job branding the company, uh, marketing the listings, marketing the properties for sale, and you know, doing a great job, uh, you know, getting you guys business. But you also will want to be doing your own personal marketing, whether that's sending out SOI cards, you're doing uh, mailings for listings, or farming a community. Um, some of those are great. You know, there, there's a lot of tried and true methods out there, but. Every once in a while, probably more often than not, a lot of uh, new things come up that you want to try. It may work for you, it may not, but you need a way to tell if it's working for you. Uh, and it's to track how that business is coming to you. A lot of people will ask, how'd you hear about me? How'd you get my, my name, my number? And you're relying on that client or prospective client to tell you, oh, I saw it on a postcard. Well, it may have taken five different things to get to you but that postcard was the thing that made them call. You, you don't know which one it was. So what I recommend is when you do new pieces and you're trying new marketing uh, strategies, do a couple different things. If you're putting a website on there where they can go, use a different URL, use a different address for them to go to and you can track the, the traffic <coughs> coming to that website. And it can link to your normal website, just it has a different URL that you can then say, okay, you know, 20% of that business came from this marketing piece, it's working. Or you can set up a different phone number, whether you want to have two different cell phones or have Google numbers that ring to the same phone, you can set it up so you're tracking those calls and you can tell, is this piece of marketing working or not? Because a lot of people say, oh, do this, it's great, you'll get a lot of business. Well, your business may have gone up, but you don't know why. And if you can track and say, you know what, this, I'm putting $2,000 a month into this, it's really not working. I can either save that $2,000 or I can take a thousand and try somewhere else and pocket the thousand. You, you'll at least know if it's working or not and how to better spend your money. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have to spend the money, don't spend it. That's money that you get to keep in your pocket. Um, also, your other expenses, are you spending too much? You know, review your cell phone plans every once in a while. Say, hey, am I, am I making the calls? that I have under my plan? Am I using too much data? Do I have, am I buying too much data for my cell phone or, or what have you? Um, just keep track of your spending. And that's where that, that uh, bank account software comes in handy is you can sort, you can run reports based on categories, expense categories, and track how much you're spending in each category. And then you can say, yeah, that's working. No, that's not working. I, can, I need to adjust my spending. Uh, Company provided tools, that's another great benefit. Uh, there are some things the company pays for. There's a lot of tools that we that we offer that are you know, that are agent costs that you need to pay for. But we have negotiated rates on a lot of different tools that you can use rather than going out to a different vendor. If you use those those vendors that we are under contract with, you will be able to save a lot of money on, on your specifically on your marketing costs. So you know Make sure you're, you're meeting with your, your staff. Uh, I think you have um, marketing coming in tomorrow. Yes. So you know, ask the questions, hey, I want to do this. Is there a way that 
you know, does a company offer something or is there a vendor that the company uses that I can get reduced costs? So take every advantage you have to save some money. Okay, any questions? Anything so far? Okay. Um, all right, as I said before, we'll talk a little about insurance. Other, right on the far. Oh, right. Okay, it's not up here, but other considerations. Um, I want to talk a little bit about insurance. Um, you know, you all know about E&O insurance. Well, you know, you don't necessarily have E&O insurance with the company. What you have is legal defense fund. E the E&O insurance covers the company, but with that, to you, um, you know, we have that the legal defense fee that comes out every year. You're paying three hundred sixty-five dollars, and that's that. You know, puts you under the E&O you know, policy of the company. It also provides um, legal support for, you know, you have a legal question, you can go talk to Brett, Brett can make a phone call to um, our in-house attorneys or our outside attorneys, uh, Westman NOAC, and get you the help that you need. So it's not just an E&O policy, it's a whole legal defense package. But in addition to that, uh, other insurances you may want to look at are, you know, auto insurance, um, you know, state minimum, have, you know, the, the coverage on state minimum is really low, and as a company, we require that you have higher than that. And I did a check it there. Our uh, minimum for the company is $250,000 coverage per person, $500,000 per, um, per accident. I might even suggest going higher than that. Personally, if it was me, I'd go higher than that because the, that just means that the insurance company will cover that. Anything above that, you'd be liable for. So if somebody gets really hurt in a car accident, you could be liable above and beyond that for another five hundred million dollars. Unless you put it in an LLC. Unless you put it in an LLC, but then the LLC <laughs> is actually responsible for that, um, and it can bankrupt the LLC. No, your personal assets aren't harmed. However, you still have that that burden, that headache, and you get to go to court. You get to be sued rather than insurance company taking care of it all. So again, look at your finances. Look to see what makes sense for you. Additionally, you also have, I would recommend a general liability policy or also called an umbrella policy. Talk to your insurance agent about it. It can protect you for things that aren't covered like under an auto or um, under the, you know, legal defense. Um, you know, businesses will, will do this. And I would rec definitely recommend if you were to go and ask for LLC, have that liability or umbrella insurance because it can protect you, again, if something were to happen above and beyond that auto. Um, you know, something happens in the car and it exceeds your maximum, the general liability can kick in and take care of that. But again, talk to your insurance professional about that and find out what they would recommend, what the limits that they would recommend for you. All right, any questions? Anybody has comments? All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Love you guys.